Continue singing with number 532. Oh, that will be glory. Number 532. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I am safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be
my favorite testimonies tonight. <laughs> Rich Christensen. I, I, he's going to come and give us a word of testimony. I always enjoy hearing what he has to say, you know. It? And he, he hates to do this, but he, he does it for me every year, don't you, brother? <laughs> come on up here. <laughs> gets any easier, man. Never gets any easier. So we'll start out with some scripture here. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee in the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately... Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, where dost thou doubt? And when they came into the ship, the wind ceased. And I underlined immediately because he didn't let Peter wallow out there and stuff like that. He actually immediately helped him. Um, I've been down here for 30 years. And um, don't like hurricanes. Never have. And uh, this last hurricane that came and stuff like that, uh, we never had hurricanes come. It's like everything else, when something serious comes in your life, you start getting on your knees and praying. You start praying. So I'm praying. I said, Lord, take away this hurricane. And then it's kind of a, you hate to really put it this way, but they're praying to get rid of the hurricane and not really wanting to send it to somebody else, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but I mean, you know, basically what you're praying, I mean, you'd like it to go out into the water, but that usually doesn't happen. You know what I mean? So this time, this last one came, and I'm praying. I said, Lord, uh, take away the hurricane, and boom, it's gone. You know, it goes this way. You know what I mean? So thank you, Lord. And all of a sudden, it's coming back this way again. I said, come on, Lord. Come in next time. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, basically, um, the media and friends and the radio and all that kind of stuff, oh, ye of little faith, uh, I bailed this time. I mean, I, I really hate to say it and stuff like that, but I really did. I mean, I, I just, this is the first time I used to always hunker down. This time I didn't hunker down. So um, I figured we are going to make a trip out of it, so I got my daughter and my grandkids and my wife and stuff like that, so we figured we are going to make a trip to Missouri, which was supposed to be, be at the most of an 18-hour trip. 31 hours later, we hit Missouri. Um, I kind of feel a little bit, I don't, I, it's not even going to be close to it, but I kind of feel a little bit about the, the pastor talking about Revelations, about the encounter of Jesus and stuff like that. I got a little, little glimpse of what it's kind of like out there, basically. I, I, I kid you not. <laughs> I mean, every man for yourself. Seriously, no gas. Uh, it, it, it was bad. I mean, I mean, I, I, it was bad. It was really, really bad. In fact, one time for the gas and stuff like that, I actually was di directing traffic, just trying to be a so-called peacemaker. You know what I mean? And this whole time I'm praying, I'm praying, I'm praying. Finally get to Missouri, and I said, I don't want to hear anything more about the storm. I just want to go to bed. But I told my brother-in-law, I said, uh, would you guys mind you know, going to church on Sunday morning? I said, okay, no problem. I'll, I'll take you. So we go to church on Sunday morning. What do you think, believe it or not, what do you think they're doing? A missionary comes. He says, oh, man, we just pumped up for this. And that's it. You know what I mean? So the missionary spoke. We're going to have a missionary speak at um, the Sunday school. And then we're going to have a missionary speak again that night. So I told my brother, okay, let's go to Sunday school. Let's go uh, to the night time. Okay. And I said, okay, let's just kind of go on home. And I'm thinking, well, you know, these guys were, I mean, they weren't, you know what I mean? They, they, were, they were grounded. I mean, they used to go to church all the time. I said, kind of. Got away from a little bit. Yeah, not, okay, no big deal. I, I could have forced the deal, but I didn't, unfortunately. You know? So um, we waited till Friday, and we figured this time we're going to book a hotel, and that way we don't have to worry about it too much and stuff like that. We left at 5 o'clock in the morning. We booked a hotel on the other side in Atlanta. An eight-hour trip. We ended up getting there at 1130. So, I mean, I think th there was a lot of people in Florida making this trip. You know what I mean? So uh, we get home, and um, come to find out, man, still got power. Nothing happened. Lost a couple little shingles. Lost my mailbox. Oh, ye of little faith. Okay, so there's the faithful part. Okay, now the next part goes. Uh, the visitation. I kind of gave a little bit of talk on the visitation and stuff like that. I've been doing visitation and door knocking for many, 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 many years. Uh, back in the days and stuff like that with the visitation we used to do, we used to do it on a Tuesday night, Thursday night. Cassie, a lot of times, would set up places where we could actually go where they knew where we were coming to see them. Um, that didn't really mean a lot of times that they were going to actually be there. Or even if they were there, a lot of times they might be coming through the window and stuff like that. But anyway, you know, it's, but we still went and stuff like that. Well, now we're doing the, the dozen doors. And uh, before I used to always go with more grounded, more 
people that are getting more used to it and stuff like that, it's kind of great. Well, as far as if it does indoors, lately for the last couple, two or three years, it's been used less. And I don't want to take anything away from less. I think it was Pastor Dan one time that said that I don't want to be behind that man when he's in that tent. Because I'll tell you what, man, that, that man there is one of the most faithful guys I've ever seen. Anyways, uh, we've been going knocking on doors for many, many years. Um, it's, it's rough. It's crazy. I mean, to be actually, to be able to be invited into somebody's house nowadays is kind of like, I hate to say it this way, but it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, you don't even see that anymore. A lot of times we'll say uh, no soliciting. A lot of people say, you're not soliciting. Tell them about the Lord, you know. Well, if it says that, I usually just hang it on the door. But um, basically, um, like I said, people are nasty. People are, you know, I mean, stuff like that. And unfortunately, a lot of times I kind of get to the point where I don't really get a burden like I should be to those people anymore. Next scripture verse, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walking about seeking who he may devour. And I'm pretty sure that's what the devil's really wanting us to do, is kind of get complacent about souls. I'm saying all this kind of stuff, basically, as far as the missionaries go. Um, basically, they're the faithful ones. They're the ones that are really trusting in God in everything. I mean, basically, you know, we go knocking on doors. We pretty much go to the... Pretty, you know, this is Sarasota. Most of the neighborhoods are pretty good. I mean, my kids call certain parts of Sarasota the hood, if you know what I'm kind of probably talking about. But anyways, the way I look at it with these missionaries, they're pretty much living in the so-called hood. You know what I mean? And when we get done knocking on doors, we can pretty much go back to our family, to our nice home, to a church with a lot of Christian people. The missionaries are kind of like just kind of stuck up there. So what I'm basically trying to say is the least I can do is support them with some money and support them with some prayers. Uh, yeah, I can give a lot more money. And yeah, I can pray a lot more. But basically what I'm trying to say is every year I am doing a little bit better. And it's just because the pastor keeps year after year after year. You know what I mean? And you know, it might sound whatever and stuff like that, but I mean basically it is. Um, the missionaries is, is, is a major thing, so that's why I'm trying to encourage everybody and stuff like that. Like I say, I, I ain't by no means perfect, and like I say, I, I, I need to be less complacent and stuff like that, but just think about the missionaries a lot of times and stuff like that. They got it pretty rough, and like I say, every time you think that uh, you got it uh, pretty rough and stuff like that, like I say, just, uh, like I say, just look around and stuff like that. Like I say, Sarasota is a, a great place to live, and um, like I say, even with the hurricanes, am I going to... Am I going to really still not like hurricanes? Yeah, that's a duffer. You know what I mean? Am I, gonna, am I still going to go on a visitation? Yeah. You know what I mean? But I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to try to have a little bit more ability to souls. And like I say, is God still faithful? He's still the faithful one. Is God still good? Always. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we just uh, thank you for this church. Thank you just for the pastor. We just uh, pray for the missionaries, dear Lord. Pray for us, dear Lord. Just uh, keep us a burden for souls. Uh, we just thank you for our salvation, dear Lord. No other place can get that, dear Lord God. We still, again, pray for this country, pray for this world. It's still, America is still the greatest place, Lord, but just uh, just don't let us uh, just don't let us not think like that much, dear Lord. It's, it's still you know, the best place to live right here. Uh, just help us to thank you for the blessings you have with us. Thank you for the shortcomings that we do even get, dear Lord. And like I say, you're, we're a learning process, dear Lord. Just help us to grow. Thank you, Jesus.
thank you for that. We're going to let the young people be dismissed for Patch the Pirate Club. We'll take our Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, look with me down at verse number 8. <clears throat> if you can stand with me, we'll read this one verse of Scripture tonight. Verse number 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication so we're looking at the six angels of judgment here in revelation this is the second angel first angel had the message of the gospel and the first angel the first angel with the gospel the first angel delivering the gospel and the first one that had that opportunity because the angels don't have that opportunity today but they uh, there will come a time that that first angel will be able to deliver the gospel over the whole world. And now we see the second angel. And the second angel speaks of Babylon. The second angel speaks of Babylon. We'll speak about that tonight for a few moments. Dear Lord, I pray that you would bless the preaching of the word of God tonight. I pray this sermon after sermon, dear Lord, that you will bless it and that Father, the Word of God will penetrate the hearts of the people. <clears throat> we will listen. Father, I pray that we will be convicted by the preaching of the Word of God. I pray, Father, that we would uh, tonight see how important it is that we get the gospel into all of the world. You see the importance of getting the gospel into all of the world. You're sending an angel during the tribulation period to take the gospel and there's going to be another angel that's going to be spreading a message about Babylon and that message is so that man will repent and turn to God before it's eternally too late now dear Lord I pray that we would see the importance of taking the gospel into all of the world we would see father that we don't just have these missions conferences just to take up time, but it's serious business. It's about taking the gospel into all the world. And Father, I pray that tonight we would be convicted about that more so than ever before. Now, bless the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> I was trying to sing. I was trying to keep up with the singing there. I think I was singing too loud. <clears throat> and I, I didn't have a hard time. I was enjoying singing. You know, I used to just belt it out. I just can't do that anymore when I have to preach. You know what? I just don't have the same voice that I used to have years ago. A preacher was waxing very eloquent on preaching about the tribulation period. He's preaching about all of the judgments that are going to take place. He talked about the sign judgments and the trumpet judgments and the vile or bold judgments. And he's preaching about these things and about all of the things that are going to take place. We've been looking about uh, these things that are going to take place during the tribulation period, the earthquakes and all of that. During, all, during that hard preaching, a little boy looked up at his dad and he said, Dad, you think they'll let us off for school that day? <laughs> You never know what's going to go through the mind of a child, do you? <laughs> They're always thinking about something. The second angel speaks about Babylon. As we mentioned, there are six different angels, the angels of judgment here. In this particular scene that we're looking at, they each have a message to proclaim. And uh, their messages are anticipating the judgment uh, that will follow the seventh trumpet. And there in Revelation chapter 11 and verse 15 and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever we see that after the sounding of that seventh trumpet there will be seven 
vile. They're called vile or bold judgment. These will be in rapid succession that will follow after that. During And this is the end of the tribulation period. And this is all for one purpose, and that's to have, let man have the opportunity to repent. One last time, to let man repent before it's eternally too late, before the judgments are all poured out, man should repent. And so tonight, we're going to look at the second angel speaking uh, of, about Babylon. The second angel speaks of Babylon's, first of all, look at verse number 8, speaks of Babylon's descent, number 1. In verse 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. We say the second angel speaks of Babylon's descent. Babylon is going down. Babylon is the last uh, kingdom of the world, and it will be the greatest kingdom of the world during the end of the tribu- during the tribulation period that the Antichrist will uh, be uh, ruling over. So we see the second angel speaks of Babylon's descent repeatedly. The angel says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why is it that he would repeat that twice like that? Why would he do that? It's for emphasis. When we repeat something twice, we always do it for emphasis, don't we? And the same reason here, they're doing it, uh, the angel is doing it for emphasis. He underscores the finality of it all, the certainty of Babylon's judgment. This final world empire is going to come down. The second angel speaks of Babylon's descent, first of all, repeatedly. Then he speaks of Babylon's uh, descent as though it had already happened. Look what he says. uh, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. In other words, he's speaking as though it had already happened. But it didn't happen. Babylon's uh, future is ahead. Uh, But he's speaking of it as it already happened because it's going to be so certain that it is going to happen. Babylon will fall. This world empire that the Antichrist is ruling over, it will fall. It will come down. This will be the most powerful... uh, Empire in all of history. We look back and we see all the world empires. This world empire during the tribulation period will be the most powerful in all human history. And so the followers of the Antichrist that are in this world empire think that it's inconceivable that it would fall. See this angel, understand this angel is saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. This is during the tribulation period. He's making this announcement to the world. It's inconceivable that that empire would ever fall. To help you to understand that, here in America, we find it inconceivable that America would ever fall, don't we? We find it inconceivable that America would ever come down. And yet, understand this, we don't see it in these last days. We don't even read about it here in the book of Revelation. Do you understand that? Do you know what that means? That means it's not there. We feel the same way about America that they're going to feel about that world empire in that day. Babylon, as it's called. Chapter 13, verse 4, And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? You see what they're saying? Who can go against the Antichrist? Who can go against him? No one can go against the Antichrist. I can almost hear people say here in America, Who could go against America? No one can go against America. Oh, is that right? They're doing it already, aren't they? I mean, that North Korean guy, he's not afraid of America. He's got his finger on that button to push the atomic bomb. Did you hear what their ambassador said the other day? He said it's inevitable. He said there's going to be a nuclear war. That's what their ambassador said the other day. Be careful. Be careful. We're looking 
at the final world empire, Babylon, here in this passage. The second angel speaks of Babylon's descent as a great city. Look what he says. It's a great city. Babylon in this passage, of course, is referring to the Antichrist's worldwide political, economic, and religious power empire. Political, economic, and religious. Babylon has always symbolized evil and rebellion against God. It was founded by Nimrod. Back in Babylon, Babel, as it's called, was founded by Nimrod. Back in Genesis chapter 10 and verse 9, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was proud. He was powerful. He was Christ. He was a God-rejecting ruler. Babel is the site of Babylon. The first organized, idolatrous, false religious system. Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they dwelt there, and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn it them thoroughly, thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad from the face of the whole earth. This is a tower of Babel that they built. It's called a, a ziggurat. Now, a lot of people are under the impression that they built the Tower of Babel in case there was another flood so that they would have a place to go to get out of the flood. And that's the way a lot of people want to think. But my friend, uh, a ziggurat is an edifice designed to facilitate adulterous, uh, 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 idolatrous worship. That's what it's all about. A lot of people like to think, well, they just built that in case there was another flood so that they would have a place to go above the flood. But no, my friend, it was, it was a place of worship. That's what it was all about. Idolatry worship. And God judged them, and God uh, confused their languages, and God sent them over the whole world. How did all the people get all over the world? There it is right there. God spread them over the whole world. God confounded their language, and he spread them over the whole world. Genesis chapter 11, verses 5 through 9, And the Lord came down to see the city and tower, which the children of men built it. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore the name of it is uh, of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad uh, upon the face of all the earth. Now, that's how it happened, amen? God created all things. God made man. It didn't evolve. We didn't come from monkeys. It wasn't little monkeys running all over the earth. They came, became man. God made man. And then God scattered man over the whole world, amen? That's how it happened. Evolution, they have no, they have no understanding of that at all. How'd everybody got different languages? God did it, amen? That's, a, that's an explanation. That's the only explanation. They can't get it. But did you ever think about this? Here's something for you to think about. These people were idolatrous worshipers. And God confounded their languages confounded their language, and that's how we got all the languages, and then he scattered them all over the whole world. You know what happened? They brought their idolatrous worship with them. 
Say, how did all these people, how did all these religions come about? That's how they came about. They came from that one place. What's going to happen in the tribulation period? They're all going to come back together again, aren't they? <laughs> Do you ever think about that? Well, that's what's, that's what's going to happen. As humanity was united in an adulterous, false religion at Babel, they will once again be reunited at the end times in the tribulation period. It'll come full circle. In fact, we can see it happening today, can't we? I mean, it's happening right in our neighborhood, right here. In our neighborhood. Churches are going back taking their names off, throwing away the Bible, throwing away the doctrine. They don't hold to anything. They, have no, they don't want to hear about doctrine. They say, well, doctrine separates. Yeah, it sure does. It sure does. They're accepting everybody. They say, well, we can't preach doctrine. You can't preach doctrine if you're going to have everybody come in there because they're not going to like it. Everybody's not going to come to Liberty Baptist Church because I mean, we preach doctrine here, amen? I preach the old King James Bible, and I'm not quitting. And they don't like that. They want, uh, they want uh, everybody's view. Everybody wants to have their little say. We got one doctrine, amen. We got one book we're standing for, amen. We're not going to change. They're, they're not all going to like that. I found out a long time ago. Everybody doesn't like me. My wife likes me. My children like me. God likes me. No, thank you. <laughs> There's a few people like me still. But I know everybody's not going to like it because we're going to preach the same old Bible, amen? We're going to preach the same old doctrine. In my Sunday school class, we're teaching the Bible doctrine. We're going right through it. Uh, uh, the class, uh, we're, in, we're talking about sin, what the Bible has to say about sin. I, I thought to myself, you know what? If I tried to teach that in other places all around, they'd throw me right out. You know what? They don't want to hear about sin. Fact is, we got a church. There's a church out there. I think that church is off Clark. It's a Clark or uh, Proctor Road way out there. But they they don't even believe in sin anymore. I saw it on their website. They don't even believe in it. There's no such thing as sin. Well, I got news for you. If you believe the Bible, there's still sin. <laughs> Churches are all gathering, dropping their name off. You know, that's fine with me. I, if they're not going to be... If they're not going to be a Bible believer, I wish they'd take the name Baptist off there, amen, so people know what they are. They want to be wishy-washy. What they call the wishy-washy church? Why don't they just call it that? They just need to call it wishy-washy church. Well, I'll go there and have a wishy-washy service, you know what? You come here, you know you're going to get preached to, Amen. You know you're going to get the Bible. Because I'm going to read it right from the Bible and say, this is what the Bible says. God's prophecies are going to come true. Amen? God's Word is true. Did you know this? You probably didn't even know this. That Christopher Columbus wrote a book on, on prophecy. Did you know that? He did. It's called The Book of Prophecies by Christopher Columbus. No kidding. This is no joke. He wrote a book, the book of prophecies. In that book, he wrote that the end of the world would come in 1656. No kidding. <laughs> really? He said the end of the world would come in 1656. I don't know what you thought about Christopher Columbus, what one way or the other, you know, and I don't, you know, he was wrong. <laughs> Because we're still here. His prophecy was wrong. There are a lot of people that make those prophecies. You know, they, they make their little statements. They say these little things. And they, and they don't happen. 
But what God says will happen. Amen? What God says will happen. We can count on it, what He says. So the second angel speaks of Babylon's descent. The second angel, secondly, speaks of Babylon's drunkenness. Look at verse number 8. Because she made all nations to drink of the wine. The second angel speaks of Babylon's drunkenness. This is talking in, when it says drink of wine there. If you were here on Wednesday night, you know that you look at the context in which it's written, you can determine what that word is. That, that word there is speaking of uh, alcohol and uh, drunkenness. The second angel speaks of Babylon's drunkenness as affecting, first of all, all nations. Because she made what? All nations. This is the reason that Babylon, when we talk about Babylon, we're talking about political, economic, and religious Babylon, right? The world, final world empire, we're talking about that, is going to, that's the reason it's going to be destroyed. She's going to make all nations to drink of the wine of her fornication, the Bible tells us there. They will drink of it. They, uh, all the nations in the world at that time, think about it. All the nations of the world in that day are going to drink together with her. And when it talks about fornication, it's talking about the ungodliness and the wickedness of it all. The second angel speaks of Babylon's drunkenness as seduction. Drink of the wine. Babylon, the last, uh, the end government, will be like a, a prostitute that entices men by getting them drunk so they can't re uh, resist their s seduction. And that's what that world empire is going to do. Going to get people so intoxicated they won't be able to re resist the seduction of the Antichrist. They'll continue to turn from God. What do we see today? We see... Our nation turning from God. People turning from God. Man, they're, they're accepting evolution, which is anti-God, taking God out of everything. Uh, uh, secular humanism, taking God out of everything. Secular means, you know what secular means, without God. Do you know that? That's what it means. It's going to continue that way. We can see the way it's going. They're going to take God out of everything. Continue to turn from God. And then the second angel speaks of Babylon's uh, drunkenness as corruption. Notice what it says. Because she made all nations to drink of the wine of her fornication is what it says. Now, sexual sin will prevail during the tribulation period. But that's not what it's talking about. When the Holy Spirit is taken out and, and He is not here to restrain man. Can you imagine? I, we've talked about this before. With what's going on today, we, I, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like when the Holy Spirit is taken, taken out. He's restraining people today. He's restraining the devil today. Holding him back. When he's taken out and there's no restraint, what in the world is going to take place? I can't even imagine. I'm glad I'm going to be in heaven. Amen. It's bad enough for me right now. I'm just not ready for this stuff. You know, I was raised up on a farm, brother. I, there are things I didn't know. Until I went to college, there were things I didn't even know. And I wish I'd never learned. People would say things to me, and i say, what in the world are you talking about? I wish I'd never heard of it. Still don't. This is... The Antichrist, false religion, is going to be, it's corrupt. Over in Revelation, look over in Revelation, in Revelation 13, look at the corruption. There will be corruption of idolatry, in Revelation 13, 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, 
that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that it may as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. They, they're idolatry. They have to worship the beast. Worshiping the, worshiping the idol is like worshiping the beast. They're, they're going to make them worship an idol. Wow. There's a corruption of idolatry. There's a corruption of murder. Revelation 9 and verse 21, Neither repented they of their murders. Murder, idolatry, and murder. Man, I just can't believe all the murder that we hear about every day on the, on the news. People murdering their family, murdering people. Man, did you see that up in Tampa? There's a neighborhood up there where three people have been murdered in the, what, the light, like the last three weeks in the, neighbor, in the neighborhood. They don't even know who it is. They're just people, they, say, they can't even figure out why would they murder these people? Just standing, and one guy waiting out there for a bus stop. People, they said, there's no re. Why are these people being murdered up there? There's going to be, you talk about murder, man, just think about it. During the tribulation period, they're just going to murder people left and right. Also there in verse number 21 of Revelation 9, there will be corruption of sorcery nor of their sorceries. You know what that, that's witchcraft. Witchcraft. I got a letter from a guy that's in prison this week. He's in prison out in California. He's a Christian. And... Uh, He told me that his bunkmate in his cell with him, when he first moved in there, he was he had a a witch a, a witch's Bible, a devil Bible, and uh, he said it got him out of the devil Bible. <laughs> I got the letter. I just got. I just read the letter. I just got it this week, and I just read it. Uh, before my meeting with reformers, this guy—it's just, it's just such a terrible. I just—I read that letter and I—I I kind of put the letter aside because it just, you know how sometimes you read these letters and they're so sad, it just makes you sad. <laughs> I just—it just makes me sad. This is a guy that visited our church many years ago, and he's in prison. Well, he said they got him out. Of, he said in this letter he. Tell says he got him out of that devil's Bible and he's got him in the King James Bible. <laughs> I said, well, that's good. <laughs> but this guy in that letter, uh, I wouldn't even want you to read the letter because it'd make you sad, but he says he, he didn't even believe that he'd be alive this long in that place because he said they're wanting to kill him. He said there are people that want to kill him in there. How would you like to live that way every day? But sorcery, in witchcraft, in the during that tribulation period, that that's, gives me the creeps. You know what? I don't like it. I don't like people dressing up like witches. It gives me the creeps. I don't like it. And uh, people think it's funny. It's not funny to me. I generally down, around this time of year, I always preach a message about that, about witchcraft and all of that stuff. I just hate to preach that stuff because it's scary I don't like it you know what but it's devil stuff we ought to have nothing to do with it there will be corruption of fornication look at verse number 21 again nor of their fornication wickedness sinfulness nor of their thievery in verse number 21 again there will be corruption of thievery They're stealing. They're thieves. These days are going to be days of corruption, evil days, wicked days, godless government of the Antichrist. But God's going to judge, judge them. God always judges sin. We never get away with it, do we? Never get away with it. 
We think we're going to get away with it, but we don't. <laughs> God will judge it. I was reading a story, an article about a fellow by the name of Carlos Carrasco. Carlos Carrasco is his name. He was, uh, he burglarized a liquor store in San Antonio. He went down through the roof cut a hole in the roof and went down through the roof and went down in there and, st and stole money and so forth and he decided that he's going to take him a bottle of alcohol with him and so he took a bottle of alcohol and he threw it up he, I mean he, he threw it up through the hole he, he hoped to throw it up through the hole but it didn't make it up through the hole and it came back down crashed on the floor and broke and that set the alarm off because you know when uh, because of the crash set the alarm off and so that scared him, so he went to climb back out of that place, and when he did, he slipped on the alcohol. When he slipped on the alcohol, he fell on that glass and cut himself. And then he climbed out of that place, and, uh, and he skedaddled. But the police got there, and they found, uh, you know, that broken glass, and they found blood, and they followed the blood path all the way. He left the blood path all the way to his house. <laughs> He just lived around the corner, <laughs> followed the blood path all the way to his house and caught him, <laughs> tried him, convicted him, and uh, sent him to jail. <laughs> you go, man, what a bumbler, you know what? What a bumbler. Uh, you know what? We don't get away with it, do we? <laughs> I mean, judgment's going to come, and at the end... Uh, those people might think during the tribulation period in the Babylonian Empire, revived Babylonian Empire, some people call the revived Roman Empire, they might think they're going to get away with it, but they're not going to. God's going to judge them. We're going to find that out as we continue to study the book of Revelation. Second angel sp speaks of Babylon's descent and Babylon's drunkenness and then Babylon's destruction. Notice those three words, of the wrath. Second angel speaks of Babylon's destruction by wrath. What is wrath? What is wrath? I looked the word up. It means violent anger, vehement uh, uh, indignation, to be very angry. So the second angel speaks of Babylon's destruction by wrath. Then we see uh, it's by the wrath of God. The second angel speaks of Babylon's destruction by the wrath of God. God's wrath in Scripture is a holy indignation. It's just. It's against sin. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. They're not going to get away with it. No one will get away with it. Second angel speaks of Babylon's destruction because, of, because it's going to be complete. It will be complete. This is the last opportunity for those on earth to repent before complete devastation. Look at chapter Revelation 16, 17, and 19 through 19. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air, and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. <laughs> the angel speaks of Babylon's destruction. It's going to be complete. That angel is going to say, you need to repent. You need to repent. But most will not. They're not going to repent. D.L. Moody said that he made the biggest mistake 
that he ever made, October the 8th, 1871. They had one of the largest crowds ever that ever met in Chicago. One of the largest crowds ever. He was preaching to. He preached a message. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Was the message that he preached. D.L. Moody didn't feel well that night after he finished preaching to that huge crowd of people there in Chicago. He didn't feel well. He was tired and he was sick. He made the biggest mistake of his life, he said, that night. He didn't give an invitation. He said, you go home and think about what you would do with Jesus who is called the Christ and come back next Sunday and make your decision. What will you do with Jesus who is called the Christ? Come back next week. Make your decision. Come back next week. Then Ira Sankey, the great song leader of D.L. Moody, great singer, he sang, and they said before he finished that song that night, the fire began in Chicago. The great Chicago fire. Thousands of people lost their homes and were homeless. Hundreds of people died in that fire. Some of the people that died in that fire had been at D.L. Moody's service that night. And they died. D.L. Moody said that was the worst mistake he ever made by not giving an invitation. He said he would never do that again. Some went out into eternity without Christ. What a mistake. The biggest mistake that we could ever make here at Liberty Baptist Church is, not, is to not continue to give the gospel out. The biggest mistake we could ever make is to turn away from missionaries. The biggest mistake we'd ever make is not to support missionaries. That would be the biggest mistake that we'd ever make. This church would go to nothing if we don't support missionaries here. We might as well close the doors. I told about churches. We know churches in our area stop supporting missionaries, and they're no longer here. Betty Lou told me about a church up back home where they're from. They said that church dropped all of their missionaries, and that church went to, went to nothing. I'll tell you what, folks. If we The biggest mistake that we'd ever make here at Liberty Baptist Church is to not support missionaries, to give up, to not reach our goal concerning missions and missionaries. We have the gospel. We need to give the gospel out. We need to do that until the Lord comes back. We mustn't quit. That'd be our biggest mistake that we ever made. D.L. Moody made a big mistake. There are people that lost, went out into eternity without Christ because he didn't give an invitation. I always give an invitation. Speak to a little group of people, I give an invitation. I always give an invitation. People said, you, uh, should I give an invitation? I said, always give an invitation. Always give an invitation. Always give an invitation. Because there could be somebody out there lost without Christ. One time, it was a Wednesday night. We were meeting at the DAV building. It's now the law center over there in Fruitvale Road where I, was, where I started this, uh, this church. There was the same group of people. It was a Wednesday night, the same group of people that had been coming. And that night I gave a message, and at the end of the message, the thought came to me, these are the same people. You know all these people are saved. Why give an invitation? I thought, well, I'm going to give an invitation anyway. I knew it was a devil. I gave an invitation that night, and you know what? You'll never believe this, or maybe you will. A teenage boy that we all thought was saved came forward and got saved that night. <laughs> 
name was Dave Blackmore. I'll never forget it. He came forward and said, I'm as lost as can be, Pastor. He said, I've been faking it the whole time. He said, I'm a good faker, but I'm ready to get saved. I said, well, I'm going to lead you to Christ right now. <laughs> I said, take that devil. He got saved. Just the same group of people. You know, there could be someone here. You say, I know everybody here. Well, do you really know them? That guy was a pretty good faker. Faked his parents out. We had a guy come here one. We had a guy, I told you the story. My father was preaching one night here. Big old guy. He was a meat cutter. Worked for a, a supermarket. Alberson. Albertsons, Albertsons, he worked for there. He's a meat cutter there. Great big old guy, great big old guy. You, you, you talk about a butcher, this guy looked like a butcher. <laughs> he could carry a meat cleaver in his back pocket, you know. I mean, he was a big old guy. I, my father preached that night, and, and I came down, like I always do for the invitation. Some of you might remember it. I came down there. This guy, he was sitting right, right, right there in the middle, big old guy he began to shake i goes what in the world is going on with that guy it was scary you know he started shaking and he was shaking he was turning red and he was shaking and tears started rolling down his face and he came walking up here he came walking right up there and he looked at me and i goes what's going on he said i'm as lost as a goose preacher i said that's pretty lost brother <laughs> He said, I want to get saved. He said, I'm as lost as a goose. Led him to Christ. Right there, here at the altar, led him to Christ. He said, I want to get baptized now. And I said, okay, we'll baptize you. And uh, took him back in the baptismal room. And I said, you want to put a roll on? He said, no, I want to be baptized all the way. I said, don't you want to take your wall out? No, I want my, be my wall to baptize too. I want to be baptized all the way. I said, I'll baptize you all the way, brother. <laughs> but I'm putting my waders on. And I baptized that guy all the way. Baptized his wallet, his keys, <laughs> his ink pen, his tie. <laughs> I baptized that guy all the way. I'll never forget that. I'm as lost as a goose. I, I almost laughed because it was so funny. I'm as lost as a goose. That's something. You, you say, who's going to say that? <laughs> Give an invitation. Listen, God's equipped us. I, I'm going to close with this. I, a, a guy that preaches on the radio all the time told this story, and he told how he went to visit some friends. He preached on the radio every day. He went to visit some friends that the names of the friends were Chase. He went to visit them. They'd gone to school together, and they had a, uh, they just got a little dog. They had a little black dog, and they said, our dog loves to listen to the radio every day. Our little dog sits in front of the radio and listens to the gospel all day long. Just loves to hear the gospel all day long. When that preacher came in, a radio preacher, when he came in there and he said hello to the people, that little dog's ears went straight up like that and looked over there and ran over to him. That little dog recognized his voice from being on the radio. <laughs> That little dog was so excited about him. That little dog was just shaking all over. Little ears straight up like that, you know. It was just so excited. Because that little dog knew that voice of that radio preacher. <laughs> and the woman said, Mrs. Chase said this. She said, that dog, uh, she said, that dog really knows the gospel. That no, dog knows the gospel backwards and forwards. That dog just loves the gospel. I thought to myself, that's a gospel dog. <laughs> There's only one problem. As well as that dog knows the gospel, <laughs> that dog is not equipped to give the gospel out. <laughs> you know, I mean, it may know the gospel, but boy, it's not equipped to give out the gospel. <laughs> it just can't.
It just can't. But God has equipped us to give the gospel out. Amen? And we're to give the gospel out. And we better give the gospel out. The biggest mistake we'd ever make in all the world is if we don't give the gospel out. We had better give the gospel out. We better not fail. We better not fail. Let's bow our heads. Every head bowed. Every eye closed. God sent in these six angels warning the people of their need of salvation. We need to be warning people of their need of salvation. As difficult as it is, and what Rich was saying tonight, people are hard. There's no question about that, but we still must continue to warn people of their need of salvation. Will you be a faithful witness for Christ? You say, I by the grace of God, I'll be a faithful witness for Christ. I'm going to keep going. I'm going to be a faithful witness for Christ. Would you pray for me, preacher? Slip your hands up all through the building. By the grace of God, I'm going to be a faithful witness for Jesus. Here's my hand. Thank you very much. Amen. Then we need to pray about missions. We need to pray that God would do a great moving here at Liberty Baptist Church. Our missions conference is just coming up in just a couple more weeks. That's all we have. A couple more weeks of prayer and fasting is all we have. We need to be praying. We need to be pleading with God to do a work in our midst that we might continue to send the gospel into all the world. God cares about it so much that he's going to be sending his angels during the tribulation period. That shows you how much God cares about it. We need to be taking the gospel into all the world while we still can. And I hope and I pray that you'll ask God to help you to do your very best for missions in this next year. Ask God, what would you have me do for missions? What do you want me to do, dear God? Help me uh, to have faith, to trust in you, and to rely upon you, to move out for you, to do greater than ever before. I hope that you'll pray about that. And I hope that you'll come to the altar and pray about it tonight. Say, Lord, what would you have me to do? What would you have our church to do? Then I always ask this question. Do you need to take heed of the warning tonight and trust Christ as your Savior? Do you need to take heed of the warning tonight and trust in Christ as your Savior? You say, I do. I need to trust in Christ. Maybe you've been faking it maybe you've been fooling but my friend you'd say i need to receive christ as my savior would you pray for me tonight would you slip your hand up and put it back down anyone say i'm tired of being i'm tired of playing around i'm tired of being a fool would you pray for me tonight dear lord you know everyone here in this place you know our hearts father i pray that uh, Tonight, these people that raised their hands and said, Yes, I'm going to be a witness for Christ. I'm, I'm going to warn people of the need of salvation until Christ comes, till death comes. I'm going to keep doing it. Dear Lord, please, don't let them stop. Don't let them quit. Don't let them give up. You've equipped us so that we can give out the Word of God. And Father, I pray that we would. And it would be the worst mistake in all the world if we would stop supporting missions. Dear Lord, Help us to support missions more so than ever before. Father, give us a determination that we're going to do more for missions than ever before. That we're going to take the gospel into all the corners of the world. We're not going to stop. We're not going to give up. We're not going to give in. And dear Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us as we look forward to our missions conference. And let it be the greatest ever. Father, bless in this invitation tonight may your people come and plead for your help and plead for your mercy god i pray that people would come tonight in this invitation time and we pray these things in jesus name amen stand to your feet god spoke in your heart won't you come to the altar tonight won't you come and pray for our missions conference won't you come and pray for souls to be saved won't you come tonight as we begin to sing as we begin to sing